Welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. Today, it's being hosted by the Fairwinds crew. I am Maggie Gunderson, and I'd like to welcome you to the show, along with Caroline Phillips, Program Administrator for Fairwinds, Toby Aronson, our media producer, and Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer. We have a lot to tell you about today. Fairwind's Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson is traveling to Japan this week, and he will be presenting in Iwati Prefecture next weekend. Today, the Fairwind's crew will discuss what's going on in Japan regarding the meltdown of Fukushima Daiichi, its continuing impact on the Japanese people and the rest of the world, as well as Japan's current push to restart its atomic reactors under the Abe regime. Arnie? What are you looking at for your first prospect in Japan? What's really going on over there? Yeah, you know, the country's uh, seriously contaminated even now. It, 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 this isn't going to go away if we ignore it. The, um, I'm sure you've, everybody's seen those pictures of millions of plastic bags loaded with radioactive material in, uh, in huge dumps. Um, and you got to remember, the only thing the Japanese are cleaning is within about 50 feet of the side of the roads. So the entire mountain range that's Fukushima Prefecture is not clean. So every time the weather changes and that stuff gets blown back in, they recontaminate what they already cleaned. So people that live in the prefecture... Um, are living in what what we would call an RCA, and that stands for a radiologically contaminated area. If that were in the, in the states, if that were in a nuclear power plant, those kinds of levels of radiation would require that uh, you you couldn't walk into those areas without health physics support. So. Currently, I, there are a lot of people who are dislocated, but are people also? returning to these contaminated areas as well right now? Yeah, I think they're being forced to, to um, go back in. you got to remember, there's 160,000 people that were uh, evacuated originally, and now the number's just a hair under 100,000. So 60,000 have gone back into areas that we would consider by United States standards, highly contaminated. But what the Japanese did was they raised the standards. And um, they took away the money from these people when they were in, um, in housing, not in the prefecture. So they said, if you want to continue with the stipend we have you on, you've got to go home. So it's basically they're forcing them back into an area that's much more radioactive than it was when they left. So if you're living in Japan, who would you consider... Um, or what would you consider the most reliable source of information regarding Fukushima Daiichi, the cleanup process, radioactive uh, cleanup, etc.? Well, the Japanese consider the Fairwinds crew to be a honest source of information. And I think we're all proud that we really work hard not to sensationalize, but to tell it like it is and not sugarcoat it like the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency does or the uh, Japanese government. So we certainly are a, are a source, and I'll pat us all on the back for that. But in addition, you know, the work of um, Dr. Marco Kaltofen at Worcester Poly, uh, Dr. Tim Uso, uh down in South Carolina, and, um, and Green Action in Japan, there's a group called Green Action, um, are also um, several others that are really trying to get honest, unbiased information out there to make decisions by. So Arnie, not only are people moving back into contaminated areas, but we also have some nuclear power plants in Japan starting up again. Can you talk about some concerns regarding that issue? Yeah, Toby, that's a, that's a great question. You know, there were 54 nuclear power plants in Japan operating right before the Great East Earthquake and uh, the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. Well, there were four units that Daiichi wiped out, plus there were two others that uh, will never start again, plus there were four others just down the road of Fukushima Daini. So 10 nuclear reactors will essentially never operate again because they're in Fukushima prefecture. In addition, at least another 10 or 15 are too old to operate and should have been shut down even before the earthquake. So that 54 units has uh, tumbled down to about 26. 
Of those 26, the Japanese are frantically trying to get them back up and running. And the real reason behind it all is, you've heard it before, money. The banks have put a lot of money into maintaining those 26 power plants and paying for the staffs to sit there essentially idle for the last five years so that they um, they want their money back. And the only way to get their money back is to turn those nukes back on. So what's happened in the last um, five years is that the uh, the Japanese have haven't really made these plants any stronger. What they've done is they've reanalyzed all of their calculations and taken away all the margins of safety and said that, well, a stronger earthquake, um, these plants can can withstand. But in fact, there's been no major changes to the structure. It's frightening. You know, these, these plants are were built by people my age when, when we got out of college in the 70s. We used slide rules and uh, um, and they're old. And the Japanese refuse to acknowledge that it's it was a bad bet then, and they're going to double down on a bad bet now. Arnie, just to follow up on that for a minute, isn't it more about the Japanese banks and government putting pressure on there? You said the Japanese are doing this, and I think there's figures that between 70 and 80 percent of the people are against these restarts. There have been all these demonstrations there that mainstream media hasn't covered. So so really, I mean, isn't this more about the banks wanting their investment back and the government wanting to control still nuclear materials? Yeah, it absolutely is. You know, the, um, the Abe regime is very pro-business, and um, the banks have d- deep uh, inroads into the Abe regime. Um, and on top of that, the 10 utilities that run all of the power grid in Japan are little fiefdoms that have incredible pressure in their parliament diet. So uh, politically, the pressure from the banks, the pressure from uh, the, uh, the these 10 power companies, Tokyo Electric is only one of 10, um, and the Abe regime are totally ignoring what the public wants. And you're right, it's at least 70% of the Japanese, including almost every woman and just about half the men, don't want nuclear power to operate again. But it's being ramrodded through by financial interests uh, that, that just don't care about public health and safety anywhere near as much as they do about their own bottom line. Well, I think right now, there, correct me if I'm wrong, there may be like three reactors that have maybe restarted since uh, the Fukushima meltdown began and they sh- shut down all reactors. And when there were no nuclear reactors in Japan going, I never read about any blackouts or power outages. And my question is, how is Japan meeting its energy needs without all of the nuclear reactors that haven't been restarted either, or will not be restarted and you know in, in regards to the restart of I, there was one at Sendai and there have been a couple others are they necessary for Japan's energy power needs? Yeah there's a couple answers to that Caroline that's a great question the, the first is that the Japanese power grid is really nowhere near a, a first uh, a world power power grid. They have 10 little fiefdoms, and they don't share power across the grid. So you've got TEPCO to the north and Chubu to the south of Tokyo, and and each has an enormous overcapacity in case one unit goes down. In the United States, we have a shared grid. We pool our power. In Japan, they don't. Matter of fact, in, in Western Japan, they're at 50 cycles per second, and on eastern Japan, they're at 60 cycles per second. So they can't even agree on how many cycles per second the electricity should flow at. So um, when all these units shut down, there's a lot of excess capacity sitting around anyway, and it was largely gas and largely coal. So what happened is uh, two things. First, and the Japanese uh, really deserve an enormous amount of credit. They conserved like crazy. They they really went on an efficiency kick. Um, you know, 
I was in office buildings where the temperature inside was was 78 uh, in the summer, and um, and it wasn't bad. You know, it uh, they realized that they were overcooling in the summer and overheating in the winter, so the Japanese really went into an energy efficiency and a conservation mode. They did import more coal and 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 gas, and then they also brought in the equivalent of about six nuclear power plants worth of solar power. So they're beginning already to displace the solar power the, with solar power, these old nukes. That whole combination, they got through. And you're right, there were no blackouts. Tokyo re- re- remained well over-illuminated, trust me. Um, and, and life went on. Arnie, I have a follow-up question to that. You touched on solar. What is the actual progress with renewables? What are they doing? We had originally talked about and and done a video on the tipping point. So they were at a tipping point after all the nukes were closed where they could clearly just move ahead with solar, wind, wave action. They have so, you know, right out in the ocean, so much going on and there's so many new technologies. Are they doing this? What what progress are they making? Well, there's enormous pressure by these 10 utilities that we talked about. You know, the 10 governing um, electric boards, essentially, are putting enormous pressure on the diet so that renewables are being stifled. But even despite that, people are doing it, and, and, and corporations are doing it. You know, the, the interesting thing is that even before the uh, disaster at Fukushima Daiichi, Japan had the highest electrical rates in the industrial world. And that's a, that's an incredible burden, and th- now they're going to be higher because they just, you know, paid for five years of nuclear plants that didn't run, and they want that money back too. So electric costs in Japan are arbitrarily high because these ten powerhouse utilities control the diet, control the parliament, and uh, the people are getting stuck with high rates. So now we've got high rates that they pay for out of their wall socket, and they're realizing, heck, I can go off the grid and put a solar collector on and get it cheaper. So there's, they've priced themselves to a point where new solar is much, much cheaper than what they can get from the grid. And the big industries are realizing it too. The big industries are, are uh, building their own power plants or building their own solar collectors so that they don't have to pay these exorbitant rates that the Japanese are being charged. Arnie, moving on to um, issues regarding the outpour of radiation into the Pacific Ocean, there's been a lot of debate on exactly how contaminated is the Pacific Ocean. Is it affecting our food? Is it affecting our water quality? Can you, in a nutshell, describe to us your thoughts about how contaminated the Pacific Ocean is because of Fukushima? Yeah, Toby. The um, you know the the Japanese are focusing on leaks from the Fukushima power plants, and you know that's probably a mile of coastline, and and it is severely contaminated, and it continues to to bleed into the Pacific every day. But what no one is paying any attention to is that. The entire mountain range that runs 100 miles up and down this coast is also contaminated. And as much radiation is pouring out into the rivers and streams into the Pacific from the mountain range because it's so contaminated as from the Fukushima site. So, you know, Tokyo Electric would have you just look at the site and say, well, we're doing things to collect the radiation. But in fact, they've got an entire state pouring radiation into the Pacific. So what's in the Pacific? um, Off of California, they're finding radiation at what I would consider significant uh, levels. Um, A cubic meter is about three feet by three feet by three feet. And um, in a cubic meter of, um, of ocean water, they're finding 10 radioactive decays every second. That's called the disintegration. So that's called 10 becquerels per cubic meter. So a cubic meter of, uh, of, of water, if you were in a dark room, would have 10 flashes of light every second, and that's going to go on for 300 years. So we have contaminated the biggest source of water on the planet, and there's no way to stop it. So are you saying that the contaminated water problem is hopeless, uh, is there nothing we can do to slow it down? 
It used to be that scientists believed dilution is the solution to pollution, but I think we're finding with the biggest body of water in the, on the planet that you can't dilute this stuff. Um, and we're going to begin to see this bioaccumulation, which is all the fish that are in the uh, in the ocean are going to uptake the cesium and the strontium, and uh, and become more and more and more radioactive. So you said, Arnie, you used the term bioaccumulation. Um, if you could explain to our audience what exactly that means and sort of what that implies as far as you know food quality goes or water quality. Well, if you think of it as um, there, there's radiation on the bottom of the Pacific, and uh, that gets picked up by the um, by the whatever's on the bottom, the seaweed, and then little fish eat the seaweed, and little fish get eaten by bigger fish, and those fish get eaten by still bigger fish. Every <laughs> the time- circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> Right, you know, and that process. Every time they do that, the constant the cesium in the little fish gets concentrated in the bigger fish. It's not just radioactivity. We know that about uh, um, the the, um, it, the mercury that's in uh, that's in tuna. You know that that the coal plants have thrown mercury out into the oceans, and it works its way up the food chain too. So this concept of bioaccumulation doesn't just apply to radiation, but it is applying to fish in the food chain now. I know that I haven't heard anything announced by the FDA, and I'm not a believer that the FDA would automatically say anything, but I know we don't have any substantiated um, radio levels in our seafood coming to the United States, but what is your stance? Do you eat out and take Maggie out to sushi regularly for bits of yellowfin tuna? You know, the the, uh, the FDA limit is so high that uh, it's, the 12, it's 12 times higher for Americans than what it is for Japanese. So basically, if the Japanese find a fish that they can't eat, they can ship it to America and feed it to us, and the FDA doesn't care. So we've got uh, a really high threshold, and on top of that, the FDA is hardly sampling fish at all, less than a tenth of a percent of the fish that come into the United States are tested. Really, really small number. So my decision is I'm not eating fish from the Pacific. That's a personal decision. Um, I, I never did eat yellowfin tuna, by the way, because they're such a beautiful fish. I just really couldn't stand um, the, you know, killing one. Barney, while you're in Japan, I know that a number of presentations are set for you and you'll be traveling all over. Um, you'll be in... Uh, Fukushima, you'll be in Iwate, you'll be in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Tokyo. So so it's a, a long trip. And we have all of that information up on our site where your presentations are and what you'll be doing. In your presentations, what are you specifically talking about to these groups? What I know all the different groups have asked specific questions. What will you be answering for them? Can you give us just a couple sentences about that? What are the key points? Yeah, the first thing I'll be talking about in Japan is the use of plutonium in their nuclear reactors for, for fuel. They call that MOX, a mixed oxide fuel, but it's uranium and plutonium together inside a nuclear reactor. Running a reactor on plutonium is, one, really technically complicated, and two, expensive. There's not a reactor in America that uses MOX fuel, and there's none in the pipeline either. Why? Because our our utilities are um, trying to minimize the cost, and it's actually cheaper to use uranium than it is for mixed oxide fuel. In Japan, they don't care. You know, as we talked about at the beginning here, they, the utilities that own these power plants have control over the rates. So they're paying more for this plutonium fuel. In America, not a power plant in the country uses plutonium for fuel. Um, the mixed oxide fuel is going nowhere. No one wants to buy the used plutonium um, because it's more expensive and because it's more complicated to license. And after a nuclear accident, it also complicates the, um, the, the accident analysis. So it's, it's a real mess using plutonium. The Japanese use it anyway. And uh, I really want to talk about how I think it's a bad decision that plutonium will be used in Japanese reactors. What do you think is the terrorist risk with 
MOX reactors? You know, th- th- there's some brilliant people, and, and, and Frank Von Hippel is probably at the top of the list at Princeton, who have been saying for 20 and 30 years that having plutonium driving down the highways to fuel a, a power plant is a real terrorist risk. And the reason is that if you capture a truck that's got plutonium and uranium in it, the, um, uh, you can chemically separate out the plutonium and make a bomb. You don't need a, a real fancy uh, uh, gaseous diffusion plant and billions of dollars. You can chemically pull out the plutonium and make a bomb. Raw uranium is at 3% enriched, and in order to make bomb-grade uranium, you need billions of dollars of enrichment. But if there's plutonium in the mix, um, you can make a bomb. And another difference in my understanding of, of uranium, raw uranium versus plutonium, is raw uranium is actually cheaper. Is that right, Arnie? Yeah, it's cheaper to mine uranium out of the ground than it is to reprocess the old, what the industry calls spent fuel, the highly radioactive spent fuel, to pull out the plutonium to reuse. It's on the order of a, a millions of dollars more expensive to extract the plutonium than it is to just dispose of the plutonium. You know, this is one of these unintended consequences of nuclear power that dates back 70 years. We've um, got the plutonium now, and um, rather than put it in a hole and, and, and walk away for a quarter of a million years, the nuclear industry comes up with yet another scheme to get rid of it, and by, quote, reusing it. But at the end of the day, it's even more expensive than the first scheme, which was just uranium. Arnie, one of the things that um, people have asked me again and again is what about France's reprocessing system, and it's supposed to be so amazing and working so well. Is it? You know, I'd refer the readers to a great podcast we did, uh, oh, geez, about a year ago with Michael Schneider. And uh, so they could go up on our site and search for Michael Schneider. And Michael spelled M-Y-C-L-E. Um, and, and he is French, and he totally destroys the myth that uh, the French are doing it right. In fact, plutonium in France is uh, uh, has negative value. It's it, They have to pay people to take it because it's um, it, it, it's such a different type of fuel to use in a nuclear reactor. And I remember that. I think we called it the nuclear fuel chain is broken because they often call it a fuel cycle, but it's not a cycle. You always end up with nuclear garbage that has to be abandoned somewhere for thousands of years. And yeah, I remember that one. It has that great picture of all the cyclists falling because chains are broken. So... Along with um, these MOX plants that you'll also be discussing in Japan, um, are you going to touch on the restart of other reactors and, and issues that come up with those and sort of aging reactors and design issues that kind of have been left unregulated as, as far as I know in Japan? Japan's got three operating nuclear reactors now, with another perhaps five more scheduled to start up this year. Um, And again, the only reason is because the banks want their money back. But what the Japanese have done to get these old plants, they're all 30 years old already, um, to get them qualified to start back up, they they just changed the calculations on the paper. They didn't physically change the power plant. They just changed the calculations on the paper and essentially took away safety margins. These plants are no better now than they were five years ago, but they're all five years older. And I'll be talking about concrete wearing out. You put concrete in the ground, it wears out. Um, Plastic uh, insulation on the wires over time, they get brittle. Fire risks at these old power plants at, and neutron embrittlement, which is uh, we also spoke about on the fair and site. All of those issues are there in Japan because they're, all their plants are so old. And uh, I, I don't think the right choice is to invest billions and billions of dollars into these old plants. You know, put that billions and billions into a renewable grid and you'd see real progress that's sustainable. Well, Arnie, we really wish you a good trip, 
and we look forward to receiving your um, mini podcasts to us from Japan, and we want to hear more. So we look forward to hearing about how your trip goes, and we really will hope that it makes a difference and that uh, the Japanese people know that we hear them and we definitely want to see the government respect their wishes and shut down these nukes and invest in renewables. Thank you, and we'll keep you informed.